The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webinar. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uh, two very important topics, uh, design flexibility uh, and performance measurement uh, as they relate to bicycling and walking. Uh, we've got a great panel here to talk with you all about that. Uh, my name is Dan Jolene. I work with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center here at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. Um, and I want to introduce uh, the panelists to you now. Uh, first off, uh, joining us uh, from Federal Highway Administration is Dan Goodman. Uh, Dan works with the livability team uh, within the FHWA Office of Human Environment. Um, he's going to be sharing some information with you about work that FHWA is doing uh, to promote bicycling and walking um, in a variety of ways, including uh, the publication of these guys we'll be focusing on today. Uh, Michelle Danilla with the Tool, with Tool Design Group uh, is representing the team uh, that developed the new FHWA guide on achieving multimodal networks. Uh, and then we're joined uh, by Carl Sundstrom of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center uh, and Connor Simler of Kittleson and Associates. Uh, who were on the team that led the development of FHWA's guide on developing uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, performance measures. Uh, so we're thrilled to have all of these panelists here with us today, and we're very much looking forward to their presentations uh, and the subsequent discussion. I would like to shift gears uh, for just a moment to cover a few uh, housekeeping items. And first, I'll ask you as the attendees, uh, if you can hear me, uh, please click the hand icon uh, that's located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you should be able to, uh, to raise your hand and let me know that you can hear me. Uh, and it looks like you can, a bunch of hands going up. So that's great. I'm glad to, glad to hear it. Glad you all could spend the afternoon with us. Um, if your computer, uh, for some reason, freezes up during the presentation today, I'd encourage you to just reload the website and log back into the program. And you should be able to just rejoin the session. Um, we've already posted the presentation slides uh, from today's webinar. Uh, and we will also be uh, posting a recording of the webinar uh, to our PBSC website. So you will be able to look back at anything that you miss. Uh, the presentation slides, again, are available now. Uh, and the video should be up within about a week um, on our website. Uh, please note that uh, you, as the attendees, will not be able to speak during the webinar, although you will have the ability to submit questions and comments to us using the chat function. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. We're going to be holding about 20 to 30 minutes um, at the end of the presentation uh, for a discussion period. Uh, later today, you're going to be receiving an email uh, from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center just as a follow-up to the webinar. Uh, that's going to include a link that will allow you to generate a certificate of attendance uh, for the webinar. So it's really important that um, if you're attending with multiple people at your site, uh, you might be the only one who gets the email since you registered. So be sure to pass that around uh, to the other attendees that, that sat in with you. Uh, to make sure they can get the, uh, the link as well. Um, the email is also going to include a link to our archive page with some other information uh, for, to for you to download the slides and access uh, other materials related to the webinar. Um, and also, like I mentioned, uh, within about a week or two, the uh, presentation or the video recording of the webinar will be available there. So you can pass that along to anybody who wanted to attend but maybe couldn't. Um, we, uh, we encourage you, uh, if you, if you haven't been there before, to visit uh, pedbikeinfo.org uh, slash webinars. Uh, you'll be able to find archives for this webinar, archives for all of our uh, previous webinars, as well as information about upcoming sessions. Uh, we do have a, another webinar coming up in a couple of weeks on November 30th that's going to focus on some new research about pedestrian safety countermeasures at uncontrolled locations. Uh, so if that is of interest to you, uh, consider visiting that site to sign up uh, for that session. Um, you can also stay up to date with uh, all the things that we do here at PBIC uh, by following us on Facebook and Twitter. We put our information there on the screen. Um, and then if you'd rather just have uh, standard old emails, we have an e email list as well. Uh, you can sign up um, at the link on the bottom of your screen there. So a lot of different ways to, uh, to stay up to date with what we're working on. Uh, before we move into the presentations, I did want to take a quick poll of the audience. Um, uh, we want to find out uh, just very quickly um, how many people uh, are attending the webinar from your site. Um, so take a moment and uh, cast your vote here. We're really uh, interested in getting a better handle on the num our uh, attendance numbers. So uh, if you could just spend a few seconds and vote. Uh, whether, let us know if it's just you out there, if you've got a small group uh, with you, um, if you're uh, joining with a, with a few other people. Uh, we'll keep that open for just a moment, and then we'll be able to move on. Okay. 
All right. We'll go ahead and close the poll. All right. And um, let me ask the rest of my panelists. I think we were maybe having an issue with the screen being shared. Uh, can everybody see the screen that I'm showing now? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we did post the slides already, so if, you, if we had a few, uh, just a couple of things that I showed earlier that you might have missed, but um, very easy to, to go to our website, pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars, and, and uh, visit that. But now we've got it up and running. Uh, what I'd like to do is turn things over to uh, Dan Goodman, who's going to share a bit of uh, information from the Federal Highway Administration about uh, things they're working on. So, Dan, uh, go right ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. And I want to thank um, the other panelists joining me today um, on the webinar. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. I work in the Office of Planning and Environment and Realty um, at the Federal Highway Administration. Um, as you're hopefully aware, FHWA has published a range of multimodal transportation resources in the last uh, few years. What you see on the screen are a few of these resources. Um, these resources really cover planning, design, and implementation topics, um, and they focus really on improving project outcomes. Um, we're really looking to improve safety, enhance safety for all users, um, really leveraging other investments. Um, so, so when we think about um, bridges and, and transit investments, for example, these resources and, and our investments in pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure um, are really intended to leverage those other investments um, and getting the design right now so that we can so we can avoid avoid sort of costly retrofits later on. That's really what a lot of these documents get at. Um, there's not any new requirements are created by any of these documents. Um, these are really resources to inform the local MPO and state um, transportation planning and decision making process. Um, so, so while we were developing these resources, our partners at, at ASHTO and ITE and NACTO um, and others, they've also been publishing resources um, on, on similar topics. Um, and in some cases, FHWA has supported the, the use of these other resources to inform um, the planning and design process. So, so we're really in a dynamic time where there are a lot of resources available. Um, and increasingly, the challenge is really finding the right resource um, and getting comfortable navigating between different resources to really um, inform engineering judgment and you know while still we want to inform engineering judgment um, while still accounting for you know local context and, and performance based planning and, and all these other things that we're um, trying to accomplish in the transportation planning process. Um, so that's really what this webinar is about today. Um, we're looking at exploring linkages between different resources and, and pushing ourselves to really think about these relationships um, from a system level perspective. Um, so I'm going to give a couple examples in the next few slides to provide context um, for the information that will follow um, from the other presenters. Next slide, please. So here are, here are two examples. Um, there's the Bike Network Mapping Idea Book on the left. And then there's a document on incorporating on-road bicycle networks into resurfacing projects on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are both projects that FHWA has published in the last year. Um, the Bike Network Mapping Idea Book, it really highlights notable examples of bike network planning at the local MPO and state level. Um, it shows infrastructure planning maps. Um, and the purpose is really to to highlight a broad range of options for showing a locally driven vision for a, a connected bike network. On the right, the incorporating on-road bike networks into resurfacing project, this project really um, focuses on identifying low-cost strategies for incorporating on-road bike infrastructure into ongoing resurfacing processes. Um, so we know that communities are resurfacing their roads across the U.S. all day, every day. Um, and what the document on the right tries to do is um, identify ways to strategically intervene in that process to find ways to get bike infrastructure done as part of the resurfacing process. It's really the cheapest and the easiest way to build connected bike networks. So it's really coming at it from a cost efficiency perspective. But what's the relationship between these two documents? Um, 
when you're looking at the sort of resurfacing project list, it's helpful to bring in the conversation of the long-term vision for the bike infrastructure. And so that's sort of the linkage that I see is that um, while we're looking at those project resurfacing lists, it's helpful to be able to then refer to the long-term connected bike network map, um, which is really a planning infrastructure map um, that was developed as part of the local planning process. And that linkage really helps you identify places where, for example, if you're resurfacing a road that would connect a high school to a regional trail system, um, is there any way that we can get a bike lane on that segment um, so that we have that linkage um, for the students at the high school that maybe want to access the trail system, which then could maybe get them home or get them to, to a job. Um, that's a, a, a linkage between the resources that we see, and it's one example. Next slide, please. So two other resources that, that FHWA published recently. There's the Road Diet Informational Guide, and then there's a Separated Bike Lane Planning and Design Guide. Um, again, what's the relationship? So the Road Diet Informational Guide um, is a document that was published by our Office of Safety. Um, it's really about reallocating roadway space to improve safety for everyone. Um, in many cases, this helps to reduce congestion um, while still um, at the same time, you know, providing some extra space to, to uh, for example, provide on-road bike infrastructure. Um, separated, the Separated Bike Lane Planning and Design Guide um, focuses on planning and design options for separated bike lanes, which are also known as cycle tracks or protected bike lanes. It's a, a dedicated bike-only space where there's a vertical separation between the bikes and the moving, the moving cars. Well, in a lot of cases, the road diet is a strategy and technique that you can use to, to free up enough space to put in a high-quality separated bike lane that really meets the needs of all users, um, especially bicyclists that are maybe a little bit less comfortable, a little bit less confident biking in direct proximity to moving cars um, a separated bike lane really speaks to that audience. And so um, in a lot of cases, a road diet is the way, the thing that provides the opportunity to put in the separated bike lane, while at the same time improving safety for all the users of the roadway. So that's a, a direct linkage that we see between these two resources. Next slide. So this is, you know, this line of thinking. We know at FHWA, we know we've been putting out a lot of resources. Um, and as I mentioned before, we know that there are a lot of other resources out there as well. And, and um, we're focusing on working with our partners and practitioners um, to really see those linkages between the existing resources. And so um, it's something that we've been focusing on um, for quite a while. As one example, um, I want to direct people's attention to the, to the Design Resource Index, um, which is available on the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webpage. Um, this is a document that really identifies the specific location of different topic areas in different um, resources, existing resources. Next slide. And I'm just going to show you an example of it um, on the next slide. So this is a, the Design Resource Index includes information on on-road bike facilities, pedestrian facilities, and shared use paths. And what you see on the screen now um, is really focused on on-street bicycle facility design treatments. And, and as an example, if you look at bicycle accommodations on bridges and tunnels, you'll see that it's addressed in the AASHTO Policy on Geometric Design of Highways and Streets um, resource. And it's also um, identified in the Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. And so what the Design Resource Index does is in the rows, it breaks out specific design features. And then in the columns, it directs the users to the location in those existing resources that address those specific design features. And so it's sort of along the same lines of the previous slides is, is helping our partners and practitioners navigate between different resources and get comfortable kind of in that process where there are a lot of different options to inform the local decision-making process. Next slide, please. So that sort of brings us to the webinar today. Um, and we're really going to be looking at today um, the linkage between two other documents that FHWA has published recently. There's our document on achieving multimodal networks, applying design flexibility, and reducing conflicts. 
Um, and then our document on a uh, guidebook for developing pedestrian and bicycle performance measures. Um, so this is really kind of along the same lines of, of what I've said previously. We want to push ourselves to think about the linkage between our options for design, you know, design techniques to improve outcomes, to improve safety, to leverage other investments. Um, and, then, and then how do those design options relate to our options for measuring performance, specifically for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure? Um, so in our webinar today, um, we're going to talk specifically about, you know, a few examples of, of what we see as the linkage between the, the more design-heavy resource and the more performance-based planning-heavy resource. We're going to talk about some examples relating to access and equity. Um, we're going to talk about examples relating to physical characteristics and also some information about safety and behavior. And again, the goal is, is to, to identify those linkages between the resources. Um, before we do that, um, I think we're going to do two quick polls. Um, we're interested in knowing from the, from the folks on the line and participating in the webinar now, um, which of the FHWA resources that are, that are shown on the poll, which of these resources are you aware of? Um, one of the things that we recognized in our strategic agenda for pedestrian and bicycle transportation, which we published in September, um, was that you know we need to increasingly focus on on outreach and promoting existing resources, and that's something that we'll be doing in the coming year um, to inform that process. We want to know which of our resources are you already aware of. Um, so if you could answer this poll question now, um, and then there will be another another poll question following, which is the same question which is with a different set of, of resources. Dan, do, would you like to say anything else about the poll question? Yeah, just to, just to say, Dan, that we've already got a bunch of votes coming in. We'll, um, we'll, we'll close this one in just a second, so please go ahead and, and cast your vote. I, I would say that there, we didn't offer an option for none. Uh, we hope that you've heard of some of these, but if you haven't heard of any of them, you don't necessarily need to vote. Um, you can just uh, let it go by. And We've got another poll question coming up right after it with five others. Uh, because we couldn't get it all into one question. So uh, I'm going to go ahead in about five seconds and close this one and then launch the next uh, question. Um, and, and, and in between that, though, I'll uh, turn the results around so you all can kind of see uh, what, what everyone else said, um, what the results were. So I'm going to close it now, um, and I'll share the results uh, so you can see them. I, I think the panelists, you all should be able to see these results as well. Um, but, but it seems that the uh, Multimodal Networks Guide um, the guide for performance measures, two of the most recognized or, or folks that heard of those, uh, maybe the strategic agenda and the network uh, mapping idea book, 36% uh, of you um, each had heard of each of those. So um, that gives you some sense of where, every, where everybody's coming from. Um, I have one more poll question uh, here, and you can uh, use the same process. Go ahead and cast your vote. Uh, we'll, we'll spend maybe just uh, 30 seconds uh, sitting on this question before we close it, and uh, and then we'll be able to move on with our presentations. But this is really uh, good feedback for you all to be giving us. I, we're really just curious about uh, what you what you're familiar with and what you're using. Um, so please uh, go ahead and continue to vote. Um, I would say maybe 10 more seconds on votes, and we will we will close this up and move right along. All right. Votes are still coming in. I'm going to say um, five seconds, and then we'll close it. <clears throat> OK. All right. I'm going to go close this up and show you the results. Um, a, little, a little more lopsided here, the uh, separated bike lane planning and design guide is, is pretty well known uh, by the folks on the line, followed by the road diet guide. And then uh, the case studies uh, on, on networks uh, guide for uh, maintaining pedestrian facilities. Um, and the, uh, the planning uh, guide for, uh, for statewide agencies, um, uh, some of the lesser known. So, Dan, that gives us uh, a little bit to go on in terms of uh, maybe some uh, resources that, uh, that we can highlight and other ones that maybe people might think about visiting after the webinar. Um, so I'll hide that uh, poll, and what we're going to do is uh, shift things over to uh, our feature presentation for the afternoon. Uh, Michelle, when you see that alert come over, you should be able to take over the screen and uh, pull it up. Okay, fantastic. I can uh, I can see your screen right now. All right, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we're going to start by doing a quick intro to each of these guides. So I'm going to start with the Achieving Multimodal Network 
um, applying design flexibility and reducing conflicts. So this document is actually divided into three sections. There's an introduction and then there's a part one and part two. Part one focuses on flexibility in design and part two focus, focuses on reducing conflicts between modes. But the overarching goal of this guide is to help implement uh, interconnected multimodal networks so people have transportation choices for their trips. So the um, objectives of the guide are to equip practitioners and policymakers with information that will help create more and better multimodal networks, address concerns and perceived barriers that practitioners face, and help practitioners see how they can use existing guidance to achieve the goal of better multimodal networks. So focusing on the flexibility side, um, which is part one of the, the document, um, good, de good designs can take into, many, into, take into account many factors. Um, design guidance cannot take into account all possible real-world situations. So what is flexibility? Um, there's a flexibility in a, a range of values like uh, lane width or design speeds. Um, there's also flexibility in the silence. Um, just because the MUTCD or the Green Book doesn't cover separated bike lanes doesn't mean you can't design and build them. So each and every one of these documents listed here um, state up front that there is need for flexibility in how practitioners need to use engineering judgment. Um, and this quote from the Green Book uh, is a good example of that. So practitioners often are concerned that if they don't strictly adhere to the guidance, they are imposing themselves to increase liability and risk. So how do you counter that with design flexibility? Um, and having a flexible approach. So you use engineering judgment, um, you document your decisions, and you do experimentations. So not applying flexibility where it truly is needed uh, may actually be a lack of reasonable care. When making design decisions, document your decisions, especially when you're applying flexibility, and build the case for why you picked this right solution. Um, in the case of traffic control, the MUTCD outlines an experimentation process and understands that flexibility is needed and can promote innovations. So on the reducing conflict side, um, the guide lists five guiding principles, which are listed here. Um, and for example, for safety, we should be asking if our designs are decreasing the likelihood and severity of crashes. And for Accommodation and comfort, for example, does our design serve all modes, all users, um, all ages and abilities? And we also want to make sure that our designs are fitting into the adjacent environment. So these are some questions that we can use and apply as we're trying to reduce conflicts between modes. So as I mentioned, the, the, the guide is divided into two parts. Um, so each the total the parts one and two contain 24 design topics and 12 focus on applying design flexibility, and 12 focus on reducing conflict. So each design topic is a standalone four pages. Um, there's a cover with an overview of the topic. Um, the middle two pages discuss best practices and design strategies. And then the last page presents case studies, which provide ex real world examples. Um, it's important to note that there are some overlaps between these design topics. So they are referenced, they are cross-referenced within, um, within the guide. So as you can see here, there's a, there's a range of topics from separated bike lanes to shared use paths and road diets um, and transit access. So we're not going to cover all of these today. We're going to cover a few that fit into the linkages that Dan just discussed. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so the next guide on today's docket is the guidebook for developing pedestrian and bicycle performance measures. And we um, we conducted this research to try and help set um, provide a document that helps agencies at all levels of, of government and um, and the private side identify and track performance measures that improve outcomes for walking and biking. Um, rec we recognize that transportation decisions throughout the history of our industry have been made by performance measures, and those measures have historically focused on vehicle capacity and delay, and as a result, we end up with built environments that um, reflect minimizing those, goal, those goals. So to make, to make better decisions and to make places more multimodal and more walkable and bikeable, we have to think about different performance measures. Next slide. So our research identified a few core challenges with 
performance measurement. Um, and first and foremost of, of those is the availability of data. We, as an industry, have a scarcity of good bicycle and pedestrian data. Um, so that's limited a lot of what we what we know and what we can measure with um, it, how we measure different projects. Um, performance measures also don't tell us which um, which outcomes or which impacts are the most important. They just help you quantify them. So we we still require bigger picture thinking on what are the priorities of a, um, of a project or of a built environment. And then the last challenge was the distinction between community goals and transportation measures. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide here. Um, we, we understand that there are a set of broad community goals um, that many different agencies tend to follow. And those are listed here on the left in rows. These are bigger picture goals through which transportation affects, which transportation can affect but it's not always directly considered um, related to. So things like improving the environment and equity and economic development, um, even public health, these are things that pub the public wants and tries to promote, uh, and transportation can have positive or negative uh, impacts on these. Across the columns on this chart are a set of more common transportation measures. Uh, these are the types of things that agencies, DOTs, tend to track. They, they are um, accustomed to the evaluating how well their systems work for on, the, on these measures. Um, but we, we tried to focus the guide on the community goal categories. And this, this table gives a reference for how those, those secondary level, level uh, measures fit within the larger goal. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between the two sets of measures. Next slide. The next, the next big consideration when considering a performance measure or identifying and tracking performance measures is what activity or what application you're planning to do. So we found that there are performance measures are used for a variety of different activities, um, plan, evaluating planning scenarios, um, comparing alternatives of different projects. That's sort of one set of measures of measurement areas. There's also long-term benchmarking, where you track progress over time in, in, in sort of an annual report. Um, another type of measurement is project prioritization. You know, people, agencies, especially MPOs, often are trying to use performance measures to identify which projects should race to the top of the list for funding. And performance measures can also represent a standard. A, a very familiar example to many in the room today would be level of service standards uh, that are set have been set historically, um, you know, in, in a certain urbanized area, you don't want to let your vehicle level of service fall below a letter D, for example. Um, there's opportunities to think about pedestrian and bicycle applications for all of these types of activities. Um, but um, so, so understanding what you're planning to do with the measures is important in selecting them. Next slide. So the guidebook is it has two primary applications. The first is to help it, uh, practitioners establish a performance measurement program, or if they already have one, to, to tweak or modify it to more appropriately match what they're looking to do. And so chapters one uh, on the screen here is the table of contents for the document. Chapters one through three walk through that and talk about the goals and talk about the applications and the different contexts that agencies exist in. The second purpose is more of a desktop reference, which we think can, it can be used on a regular basis. In fact, since it's been published, I found that, that we are using it that way. So we identified about 30 different performance measures and um, collected consistent information for each of them. And one more slide, Michelle. An example of the toolbox of performance measures is shown on this slide. So each measure has a, a two-page spread that illustrates the, the all of the variables and, and different considerations you might want to consider when identifying your performance measures and, and figure out how to how to track them. And I'll just call attention to a couple things on this slide. The um, the orange in the center bottom is a list. Is the um, for each measure we identify different agencies and we tried to 
capture a range of um, uh, geographies, whether they're local or state or, or what have you. Um, so, you, so there's a reference of agencies that are already using this measure, and you can usually find a link or information about how it's being used. Uh, the last thing to mention here is the the document is a, it's a PDF. It's available um, as a PDF online, and we inserted lots of links to move you around. So you can see at the top of the top right corner is a home button that will take you back to the table of contents. All of the related measures are linked to one another, and um, there's it's, it's, it's a, should be a useful tool on your desktop to use, um, to bounce back and forth and help figure out how you're going to develop your performance measurement program. Michelle? Hey, Connor, this is Dan. Uh, I just got a note from Michelle. I think she may have uh, dropped off the call accidentally, so uh, she's calling back okay. in right now. All right. I'm back. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. Um, Take it away, Michelle. All right. So as um, Dan mentioned uh, earlier, we're going to talk about three linkages. And so I'm going to first start for each linkage. I'm going to talk about the design strategies that are presented in the Achieving Multimodal Network Guide. And then Connor and Carl will follow up on the performance measures um, that fit into these categories. So we're going to start with access and equity. So for access and equity, um, the Achieving Multimodal Network Guide has several design topics that focus on access to transit. So we have two design topics that cover how to address multimodal access to transit stations. One's for new stations and one's for retrofitting existing stations. Uh, so for transit stations, we want to be sure that we provide access to as much of the population as possible. We want to make sure that the station layout clearly prioritizes modes and reduces conflicts between these modes. So it's recommended to establish a hierarchy and design transit stations for vulnerable users first. So this hierarchy, as shown here, um, should be applied to minimize conflicts between vulnerable road users and other station users, such as, as buses and other transit vehicles, private vehicles accessing pickup and drop off areas, and private vehicles parking at uh, the station. So modal conflict at transit stations may vary depending on the size of the station and the nature of the transit services provided. Uh, pedestrians and bicyclists may conflict with buses or passenger cars, um, but in addition, they may conflict with each other um, because the users are often sharing the same facilities such as the sidewalk, um, a shared use path, or even crosswalks. So to address the conflict through station retrofits, um, planners and designers should observe desire lines and travel routes and then evaluate them to improve safety, comfort, and convenience for those users. Um, potential conflict areas may be identified at the station, but also in the surrounding roadway network. So it's important to minimize and mitigate conflicts for pedestrians and bicyclists, and therefore you'll increase the use of these modes as a means to access the transit um, station and increase ridership. So installation of barriers or creating a circuitous um, pedestrian or bicycle route to the station entrance should be avoided. Um, so as shown in the graphic, um, key design st strategies are to provide appropriate crossing, street crossings at intersections, um, reduce crossing distances and curb radii, provide convenient and direct pedestrian and bicycle accommodations to the entrances, convert goat paths to ADA accessible sidewalks, and also provide bicycle access from nearby regional paths. So to understand desire lines, especially when you're, you're looking at a new transit station, planners and designers can conduct a, a walk and bike shed analysis um, or a pedestrian and bicycle assessment. And then based on that analysis, the, the station layout can be developed to increase ridership and prioritize the pedestrian and bicycle access routes, um, ensure accessibility requirements, and also reduce conflicts with other modes. And we can compare that result um, based on how many people are actually accessing the, the station as how, how much population is in the area. So as I mentioned before, that each, each design topic has a case study. So here, a method for improving access is to increase bike parking at transit stations. Um, so, for example, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority received funding to plan and design high-quality bike parkings at some priority transit stations. 
So a detailed station inventory analysis was performed, um, and that evaluated existing pike parking needs, um, and that was done at bus stops, rapid transit stations, and commuter rail stations. So site-specific design treatments were developed and included maintaining access and circulation to and from the bike parking facility, making sure that the bike parking facility was in a safe and visible location, and also maximizing the number of parking spaces at each station. So the guide addresses other transit conflicts, such as streetcars and bikes, um, buses, um, but we also talk about bus stop placement. And bus stop placement is a key component of reducing conflicts between bus passengers, pedestrians, um, bicyclists, and motorists. And bus stops should be located at an appropriate distance based on the context of the area. Um, for example, in a central business district, a bus stop spacing should be less than 400 feet. Um, and it should complement the sidewalk and bicycle facility that and connect, connect its passengers with the surrounding network. So from the performance measures guide, uh, looking to track or, or measure transportation performance for access and equity, we identified or called out a few here to present in the webinar, but um, the, the guide also has a look up for each of the different goals and to, what, to identify different measures that might be appropriate. So the first here is an ac access to community destinations, which is basically measuring um, the proximity of pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure to origin destinations, places that you might want to go. <clears throat> and access to community destinations can be used for a, a, in a variety of performance measure applications uh, listed on the screen here. An example comes from Portland, Oregon, where their climate action plan set an objective for having vibrant neighborhoods in which 90% of Portland residents can easily walk or bike to meet their basic daily needs. And so the mapping analysis on the screen here shows that the nice, the good walkable areas have, with access to community services and, and amenities are shown in the, the hotter colors, the, the whites and yellows. And the places that don't have such good access are shown in, in the cooler purples and blues. Um, so this is an effective way to, to see where they are, where they're providing um, the networks are offering that access, while recognizing that, of course, land use plays a big part. It's a, it's a nice way to tie in transportation planning and land use planning together. Next slide. So there are a number of measures or methods that agencies are using to evaluate or measure access to destinations. And um, they tend to take a similar spin off the same, same idea, but it's more or less the proportion of, of destinations or infrastructure or your network uh, that are within a comfortable walking and biking distance. And so for example, that might be a half a mile walk or a two mile bike. And then you, you can accumulate that over the course of a um, GIS process. Um, a note here on the screen, this, we called out the data needs and sources. And there's uh, one of these for each of the performance measures we're going to show you in, that are in the guide to help users understand what data they might might require and, and where what common sources for it are. Next slide. So the second access and equity measure is uh, thinking about the population, the, the portion of the population that is served by your walking, biking, and transit infrastructure. So you can um, use use a measure. The, the the way to measure it is to identify the, your Bike, biking, walking, and transit networks, and see how accessible they are to your to people living in the community. Um, and this is used in a lot of different ways, but the example on the screen here comes from Denver, um, where D Denver used this sort of analysis for its transit-oriented development planning, and identified on the on the map here which stations were most ready for TOD based on how well they. Uh, served the population, you know, how well the, the transportation networks around these stations, um, by which I mean the surface transportation networks around these stations, meets the, or provides that access. And um, up on the right side of the slide here is a, a, a neat little graphic that they created for each of the stations, what is the walking catchment area, and they exclude things that you can't walk to within uh, beyond 10 or 15 minutes. 
um, to show how much actual area is accessible from the station. Next slide. So uh, similar to the previous measure, the um, you, you want you want to consider your transportation networks and your demographics that your your housing and land use. I'm oh, sorry, your um, residential and employee uh, locations. So the uh, for, for example, you could calculate the percent of the population that can walk or bike to a transit station, or that have access to a sidewalk a trail or off-street trail or bike facility. Uh, on the other hand, you can think of your total transit network and how many of your stops are accessible to all, all types of pedestrians. Next slide. The last performance measure in that we're going to talk about for access and equity is the proportion of transportation disadvantaged populations served. So, this measure is really thinking about the um, the equity of our of our infrastructure. So, the proportion of low income, minority, senior, and disabled populations with access to walking, biking, and transit infrastructure. Um, this is a, definitely an emerging type of analysis. I, we're seeing this more and more as as we as we go around the country. Um, the example on the screen here comes from Evansville, where their bicycle and pedestrian connectivity plan recommends measuring the equity of the bike and pedestrian network. And they define equity as the percent of low-income or minority populations within a quarter mile and a half mile of pedestrian and bicycle facilities. And they've um, actually you know, added a 6E to their 5Es to really focus in on equity in, in that planning process. Next slide. So uh, again, the measurement here is, is fairly similar to the, the previous couple of performance measures, but layering on the demographic breakdown of um, household types and population types using census data. Um, so you can have one measure that shows how well you're performing, how well you're serving your general population, and compare that to your transportation disadvantaged population, which would give you a useful metric uh, to compare to see how well you're doing in providing an equitable uh, infrastructure. Um, and again, the data and, and specific types of measures are provided here on the screen. Next. All right, so moving on to the second linkage we're going to talk about here, which is physical characteristics. So it's important to have a complete pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure network. A connected network can reduce conflict and, and can increase walking and biking trips. So the design strategies discussed in the Achieving Multimodal Network Guide focuses on challenges of disconnected street networks and barriers, um, which may be a bridge or a complex, uncomfortable intersection. Potential solutions are to provide tax connections between disconnected streets, including wayfinding signs to help navigate and also to provide sidewalks and bicycle facilities on bridges to overcome barriers. So there's several do um, design topics that focus on this, but for today I'm going to talk about intersections and bridges. Uh, so for intersection geometry, there's a lot of flexibility in how we design intersections. Intersections should be as compact, um, compact as possible. Um, to reduce delay, reduce the crossing distances for pedestrians, and also slow turning speeds. Intersections don't necessarily have to be designed for the largest vehicle, um, as shown here in this quote from the Green Book. So to design compact intersections, considerations should be given to the layout of the intersection, including how to and the tightening of curb radii and also using curb extensions. Uh, multiple truck aprons, shown in the bottom image in red, uh, can help channelize smaller vehicles to turn slower, but also accommodate larger vehicles um, that track over the mountable area. So, so Dan mentioned this um, as well at the beginning, but bridge crossings are significant investments, and, and they don't occur that often. Um, however, bridges are critical. So they're a critical part to providing connected networks for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, a bridge without a walking or bike 
bicycling access can result in a long detour that makes the trip unpractical. Um, another consideration, which Dan mentioned earlier, is that in many cases, providing the pedestrian and bicycle accommodations in the initial construction is more cost effective than retrofitting it in the future. So USDOT um, policy encourages pedestrian and bicycle accommodations on bridge projects, um, including facilities on limited access bridges with connections to streets or paths. Uh, while federal policy in many cases requires accommodations of pedestrians and bicyclists, design guidance provides adequate flexibility on how to accommodate these users, and that's discussed more on the design topic. So another example of applying design flexibility at an intersection is this roundabout in New Jersey. Um, the mountable turf apron um, is located within the center, which is typical in roundabouts, but it's also provided on the roundabout approaches, as shown in the image. Um, this allows cars to travel the roundabout at the desired speed while also accommodating those larger trucks. All right, great. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Carl Sundstrom. Just to introduce myself since I haven't spoken yet on this webinar. Um, now I'm going to present on a couple of the performance measures um, for these physical characteristics. And so these are sort of ways to measure um, a lot of what uh, Michelle just presented, so it really dovetails well. Uh, the first that I'd like to discuss here is the uh, connectivity index. And so, you know, we've, we've really heard a lot, there's been a large emphasis on um, sort of, the, you know, creating these connected uh, biking and walking networks. And um, so, you know, the connectivity is a representation of the number number and directness of travel routes and options available. Um, and so the connectivity index is just a way to use specific measures to sort of assess the connectivity, so assess the uh, directness of travel and the number of route options that are available. And the, I think the image on the right um, provides a good example of that. So those are, you know, two, um, it's the same same area, <clears throat> same area, and you can see very clearly that in the above, in the above image, that there's uh, you know only one route option essentially available, and um, and it's not very direct versus sort of the uh, more um, gridded example uh, below, um, which is a much more connected network. Um, and so there's a lot of different uses uh, um, for uh, having a connectivity index. Um, uh, so, for example, for project prioritization, um, you could use it to um, prioritize completing uh, sidewalk or bicycle facilities in an area with with uh, already with high street connectivity. So, you know, just measuring street connectivity alone doesn't necessarily tell you if it's if it's a connected bicycle um, and pedestrian network. Um, and, you know, it, it really depends on if there are actually facilities there. So, you can use that to uh, to prioritize um, projects uh, in those types of areas. You could, uh, it's also useful for um, an alternatives comparison and comparing uh, alternatives to maximize investment potential. Um, so, you know, going back to sort of these transit examples, um, you could look at future transit stops and sort of identify um, locations that would, that would maximize the catchment area of a transit stop so, so more people are able to actually access that transit stop safely. Um, you can also evaluate, use a connectivity index to uh, evaluate the benefits of future trans transportation uh, uh, investment scenarios for walking and, and biking. Um, so you could look at, you know, something like a high capacity arterial that sort of has managed access and compare that to more of a gridded network um, and see which one would score higher. So of course the gridded network would score higher on a connectivity index. Um, so you can use that to compare future scenario evaluations and see uh, you know what what type of build out would be would be better for biking and walking, uh, particularly with with connections. Um, and uh, you can also uh, use it for standards. So you know having having uh, actually setting standards for street and network connectivity in the land development code can be can be great. So that's that's a way to sort of any time that uh, you know new new uh, new street networks are constructed or even uh, streets you know going back and retrofitting streets you know really focusing on. Um, Maximizing the the uh, connectivity index and and making sure that you know the uh, the uh, opportunities the connection opportunities and the route choices are not uh, too circuitous. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so there's there's a number of ways to track, and uh, I'll just touch on a few of these. Um, the first is uh, intersection density, and so uh, that's just simply looking at the number of intersections in a given land area. So looking at you know just the number of intersections in a in a square mile. So that's a pretty simple simple way to measure uh, a connectivity. Um, you could also look at uh, uh, the connected node ratio. So nodes nodes are uh, include intersections, but also cul-de-sacs and dead ends. Um, and so you look at sort of at the number of three-way or four-way intersections divided by the number of three-way or four-way intersections plus then you pull in those cul-de-sacs and dead ends, and you get that connected node ratio. Um, and so, and then, and then there's also something called the polygon density, where you're looking at the number of blocks created by the network within a given area. So, like, sort of, if you have uh, in a simple grid, you you can imagine that you know it's creating these these discrete blocks, and you can kind of you can count those. So. Um, you know, all these, uh, if you look on the right there with the data sources, all this is uh, typically done using um, things like, a, you know, GIS um, and, uh, and likely aerial imagery to kind of create these, uh, these maps, and then you can use GIS to evaluate uh, the connectivity index. So for the next uh, performance measure, um, I'd like to talk about network complete, completeness. So this is very much related. Um, and uh, so this is the, defined as the portion of the transportation network that is usable for people walking or bicycling, uh, and it represents the minimum accommodations needed for a facility to be considered part of the walking or bicycling network. And so that minimum accommodation, that's, that, that really can uh, you know, depend on the agency and, and also depend on the, the land use and the location um, within that jurisdiction. So you can sort of threat, set different thresholds for what qualifies based on the context. So like in a commercial area, for example, uh, a wider sidewalk may be necessary uh, to be considered um, uh, a minimum accommodation, whereas uh, in, in other locations uh, you may have a lower, lower threshold for what you may consider a minimum uh, accommodation for, for a network. Um, so kind of measuring this network uh, completeness um, can be applied in several different ways. For example, um, uh, you could use it to prioritize projects to uh, to fill um, crucial gaps or sort of meet unaddressed needs for uh, walking and biking. Um, so it's a great way to just highlight those crucial gaps and sort of prioritize projects that way. Uh, you can also use it to um, uh, report change over time through regular updates to inventory. So you can it's sort of that's a, a way that you can benchmark um, and track your progress over time as you sort of build out your uh, pedestrian and bicycle network, and you can look at things like the number of intersection treatments and bike facilities and sidewalks that you're installing over time. Um, and then you can even set sort of uh, a standard so you can make your performance um, based on, you know, having a percentage of the network complete each year um, and, you know, focus on, like, you know, making sure that all your sidewalks meet ADA standards and, um, you know, track that progress over time as well. Um, so on the next slide, um, we could talk. We talk a little bit about how to um, how to. It's what some of the common measures are for uh, for uh, measuring network completeness. Uh, and so, um, percent of roadway miles with complete sidewalks or bike facilities on both sides. And so, again, that will depend on um, what the agency defines as a uh, sidewalk or a bike facility. Um, so that's certainly one way to measure network completeness. You can also look at percent of pedestrian or bicycle. Um, uh, percent of pedestrian or bicycle or roadway system that serves pedestrian bicycles for users aged uh, 8 to 80. So, so that's maybe a, a higher higher standard uh, of facility uh, that that most users would feel comfortable on. Um, you can look at things like uh, more accessibility type measures, such as the number of signals with accessible uh, pedestrian signals that are in your network, or the number of sidewalk facilities that are accessible to all users. Um, or even the percent of bus stops that are accessible and have uh, accessible boarding and a lighting area. So all of those are really um, key measures. You can also look at um, percent of signalized intersections that have complete pedestrian and bike facilities. Uh, so you know we know that intersections are uh, particularly uh, dangerous places where many conflicts between different users occur. So um, looking at things like detection and push buttons and uh, pedestrian recall and stripe crossings and all those different measures that 
uh, and you know uh, treatments that can be done at intersections to make to sort of reduce the conflicts and, and improve uh, behaviors and awareness at intersections um, can can all be used to uh, to measure network uh, completeness. And so, you know, it, again, it depends on the agency and how much data that is, is available, uh, or yeah, the, the amount of data that are available um, will really determine what what type of analysis you can do. So, if you ha you know, the better the inventory data you have, the better uh, and ro more robust of analysis um, can be completed. Um, next slide. All right, so we're gonna touch upon our last linkage, which is safety and behavior now. Um, so Dan kind of touched on this in the intro as well, but a road diet is a reconfiguration or removal of one or more travel, uh, vehicular travel lanes. Um, they're a proven safety countermeasure that rebalances the street to better meet the needs of all users. Uh, the safety benefits of road diets are well documented, as Dan mentioned in the informational guide. Uh, four to three lane road diets have a 19 to 47% reduction in overall crashes. Adding turn lanes can reduce the number of conflict points and slower operating speeds reduce the severity of crashes. Pedestrian safety benefits include reducing crossing distances and space for potential crossing islands um, and also eliminates the multiple threat crashes. So road diets often can result in space for standard or separated bike lanes as shown here. So traffic analysis is often completed as part, or as part of a, a feasibility study of a road diet. Um, a common barrier to implementing a road diet is a traffic analysis um, that focuses on the throughput of cars only. Um, so national guidance provides the flexibility to apply engineering judgment to assess the pro project um, holistically incorporating performance measures for other modes as well as your community goals. So these two quotes from the Highway Capacity Manual clearly state that level of service or any other single performance measure tells the full story of roadway performance and emphasizes the importance of engineering judgment in the application of level of service. The issues discussed in this design topic re regarding traffic analysis can also be applied to projects that don't include road diets, such as changes to intersection configurations or signal phasing and timing modifications at an intersection or even along a corridor. So we know that there's a relationship between design speed and crash severity, um, and also the cone of vision of drivers, um, which is shown here in this graphic. So as speed increases from left to right, the risk of fatality or severe injury for a pedestrian um, involved in a crash increases greatly. So as speed increases, the driver's ability to perceive activities in the street and along the street edges um, decreases. So a specific safety concern uh, that is addressed in our um, Achieving Multimodal Network Guide is right and left hook. Um, so a right hook crash is when a right turning vehicle crosses through a bicycle or pedestrian path, and a left hook crash is when it's a left turning vehicle crossing. So research indicates that left-turning motorists on two-way streets are primarily focused on finding gaps in oncoming traffic, and a high percentage of motorists are not looking for crossing pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, also, by scanning and awareness, um, or scanning, your awareness becomes more uh, difficult for motorists on roadways with higher speeds and multi -tra multiple travel lanes. So generally, right-turning right motorists have an easier time scanning for bicyclists and pedestrians because they're less focused on finding a gap in, in vehicular traffic. Um, but conflicts often result from failure to yield or a bicyclist approaching from the rear, which is in the driver's blind spot. So these turning movement conflicts may be addressed through designs that reduce motor, motorist speeds, uh, minimize the speed differential at the conflict point, maximize visibility and predictability of all the users, and separate modes through space and time. Um, so signal phasing and timing can be used to fully separate pedestrian and bicycle movements from vehicular um, or partially separation um, by using leading uh, intervals. So pavement markings also may raise awareness of potential conflicts and can improve the predictability of movement, uh, which is shown here in the graphic. 
So for a case study, there was a two-mile stretch um, of a corridor in uh, Virginia that had a road diet as part of a routine repaving project. Um, so this was similar to many road diets. It was four vehicular travel lanes, and they were reconfigured to three travel lanes, including a center turn lane. Um, and, and by doing that, they were also able to add five-foot bike lanes in each direction. So as a result, speeds were reduced. Uh, motorists traveling over 50 miles per hour fell from 13 to 1 percent of daily traffic. Um, also, a follow-up survey found that 74 percent of all users felt that the project improved the road. Um, 47 percent said they bicycled uh, more often on the road, and 69 percent said that they their trips in a car along the road did not increase. Okay, um, so I, uh, I have one performance measure here to talk about, which uh, is crashes, a very commonly used and important performance measure. Um, so we're defining that as the, m the measured number of crashes or rate of crashes, so the, for example, the crashes per, uh, per volume of user um, over a designated period of time and then typically separated in a mode, so different uh, crashes for uh, for motor vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, um, as well as severity. So looking at different severities from fatalities down to just serious injuries and injuries uh, and property damage only. So um, so again, that's the measured number, um, which you know is generally the reported number of crashes. Um, and so there's a number of ways that they can be applied. Uh, certainly project prioritization is a very uh, common use uh, for uh, crash data. Um, so you're, you're, you typically look at the frequency and rate of crashes um, that, that can then be used to prioritize safety improvements along uh, various corridors or intersections. Um, so typically that would be locations with higher rates of specific crashes may receive that funding um, to address those safety issues before a location that may have less of a demonstrated uh, safety issue. And so, um, you know, certainly that's very common. And, uh, to do and and uh, you know obviously uh, when you do have these high profile crashes that's generally where the funding is gonna gonna go and and so that's uh, you know a very generally good use of crash data and um, you know and especially if you combine it with uh, with other ways to sort of predict other similar type of locations where uh, types of cra those types of crashes could occur um, you could also use it for uh, alternatives comparison so you could look at the frequency and rate of crashes. Uh, that can be used with different safety countermeasures to assess various design alternatives on corridors and intersections. So you can you can determine using um, different tools that we have in our toolbox. Uh, you know, determine uh, sort of almost predict the the number of crashes that may be uh, may occur uh, depending on the different types of roadway designs um, that you're considering. Um, and then of course benchmarking. So it's a very common benchmarking measure, um, looking at the frequency and rate of crashes involving pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and uh, and so you can use it, you know, for a for a full agency, or you could also use it like in a specific area that you're really actively uh, seeking to improve walking and biking conditions. And uh, probably one of the most, I guess, high profile uh, things we hear about nowadays with this type of benchmarking is uh, something is is like the Vision Zero initiatives or the Tour Zero Death uh, initiatives that we that we've heard a lot about that uh, that. Uh, cities and states are adopting where they're really working towards zero um, fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, next slide, please. And so, um, you know, crash data is, is very useful for identifying the number and severity of crashes, um, also where crashes occur, and then uh, the circumstances surrounding the crash. Uh, so, you know, all these are really important. So looking at the uh, conditions and the time of day that crashes are occurring, the different types of lighting and weather, um, who's involved in the crashes, um, the types of vehicles, sort of the pre-crash uh, events, all of that, all of that is really useful for understanding sort of the common crash types and uh, and locations. And then that way, the agencies can determine the appropriate countermeasures uh, to uh, to improve. You know, that can be that can be employed to improve. Uh, uh, safety of those locations where those types of crashes are occurring. Uh, and so some of the most common measures used to evaluate the safety of the transportation system based on crash history uh, are the number of bicycle involved or pedestrian involved crashes over five years, 
or you could look at um, just pulling out the number of fatal fatalities or serious injuries um, over five years, or you can uh, use crash rates if you if you have um, pedestrian and bicycle volumes. Uh, and the reason that five years is up here is just because, uh, you know, generally speaking, crashes um, are, uh, depending on the size of your sample, they're, they're relatively rare. And so by using a five-year, rolling five-year average, you can sort of get a much better uh, picture and much more consistent picture that sort of reduces that year-to-year -year variation that, you, that, that will occur um, just naturally when you have sort of a lower, uh, lower number. So even though you know, uh, bicycle and pedestrian crashes are a real problem. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, we still need to use, typically use something like a three to five year um, average. And so I believe with that, uh, we'll let Dan take back over. Yeah, uh, sounds great. And uh, I just want to say thanks right off the bat to uh, Carl and Connor and Michelle for uh, taking us through all of that. Um, it's a really uh, clear linkages between these, uh, between these guides. And I think that, um, uh, you know, we often hear about these tools and resources coming out, but I don't think there's a lot of discussion typically about how they overlap. Uh, so I think this is a really useful uh, thing to do. So thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for putting these presentations together. I, I'd like to uh, get into the Q&A and discussion session now. Uh, so if you haven't uh, submitted your question and you, and you have one that you'd like us to respond to, please uh, go ahead and send that over to us. You can use your chat box. Um, to do that. I want to first, though, um, uh, uh, go back to Dan Goodman and Dan ask you, um, you know, based on what you've seen here, I mean, you talked at the beginning about some key linkages between several different uh, documents. And so we kind of went and did a deep dive into one, uh, two of those documents right now. Um, do you have any key takeaways from your perspective, having kind of supported the development of these guides and um, maybe anything else that you think uh, uh, kind of clearly overlap between them? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, and I want to thank also the the panel members again. I hope I hope what came through in the presentation is really that that linkage between your planning and design techniques and then your options for measuring performance over time. Um, because ideally, kind of as our planning and design techniques get better, um, we'll see better outcomes as a result. Um, so if, you know, a few of the examples that that our presenters talked about. Um, you know, the planning and design technique is the road diet, um, and the measurement is, can we see a measurable improvement in traffic flow as a result of the implementation of that technique? Um, you know, as we look at turning vehicles, um, are there designs that we can do um, that will show a measurable increase or decrease in pedestrian and bicycle crashes um, when you design that intersection, really thinking about turning vehicles? Um, you know, our presenters talked a lot about pedestrian and bicycle access to transit. Um, and I think, obviously, the linkage to measurement there is um, to what extent are we improving access for underserved populations? Are we, to what extent are we enhancing access to jobs and schools um, and other things as a result of those pedestrian and bicycle inv infrastructure investments? Um, I think also, importantly, on the transit side, to what extent are our pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure investments successfully delivering more customers to the transit system so that the transit system can become um, you know, more self-sufficient over time? Um, and then obviously on the, the connected network side, you know, the planning and design technique is really thinking about it from a system level connected network perspective. Um, how can we use that network perspective to help us do things like prioritize projects um, on, a, on a sort of an ongoing day-to-day -day basis? So I think all those linkages, I hope, came through. And I think, you know, the big picture is sort of um, what I talked about early on is that, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're trying to improve outcomes. And so we're, we're trying to, to show how that planning and design techniques help to improve the outcomes. How, what kind of measurable improvement in safety did we get? Did we encourage more people to walk and bike? Were we successful in uh, perhaps pulling some of the people that otherwise um, would be on the NHS, the National Highway System, were we successful in switching some of those short trips to walking and biking to reduce motor vehicle volume on the NHS or, or to pull cars off of bridges and reduce congestion on bridges? 
Um, those are things, obviously, that we want to measure and, and track over time. Um, and it's really about leveraging investments and, and improving safety um, for everyone. And I hope that's also something that came through is that um, a lot of these planning and design and measurement techniques are not intended to, to you know, show a benefit to one particular user group. It's more of a benefit to, to the system. Um, and everybody benefits when there are improvements um, in safety, for example, and, and a road diet is is a great example of that because you you see reductions in motor vehicle crashes as well as pedestrian and bicycle crashes when you when you implement that design technique. Um, so those are some of my kind of big picture observations. I'd encourage other other panel members or Dan, if you wanted to add anything to that, I'd encourage you to. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan. I think that that's right on. Um, that's that's sort of what I, I took away as well. Um, and, and I think it, if anything, I think one of the big takeaways might be um, to, to look when we see uh, documents like these or guidance uh, such as these coming out, uh, and, and you all are putting out a lot of them, to maybe uh, not just uh, take it and, and digest it as its own uh, piece of work, but, but think about how it can overlap and, or does overlap with other, um, other guides that are out there and other tools and other things. Adding the, the other tool to the toolbox doesn't mean that you just reach in and grab one tool at a time, it may mean that you, you take a few sets of things out and, and look at them comprehensively. So I think that that's a great lesson to take away uh, from what we've seen here. Um, so, so we do have a few questions I'll, I'll get into, and, and they're kind of all over the place, so I'll try to wrap it all together in a, in a cohesive uh, discussion. But uh, Michelle, I think I'm going to ask you to uh, maybe respond to the first one. Um, there's a question, uh, you, you covered some things about transit. And, uh, and you provided a few, a few bits of guidance on, on you know, designing around transit uh, stations for access. Uh, one question in particular came through about um, signal timing uh, with respect to transit. So, so thinking about, um, about optimizing uh, uh, t signal timing for pedestrians and bicyclists, maybe uh, uh, keeping, things, uh, keeping things working at the signals um, so that ped peds and bikes aren't always kind of uh, rushing through or making risky decisions at intersections, if you optimize signals for them at intersections, maybe help them make uh, better decisions about crossing and so they're getting to their bus stop on time and not ma making risky uh, moves. Is, is this a clear, is this laid out in the guidance uh, that you all provided? Uh, do you kind of connect issues like signal timing with transit safety or are these sort of handled separately? Um, so, they, so they are handled separately um, in this guide. So we do have a design topic that specifically talks about accommodating bikes and heads at signalized intersections. Um, so there is one that talks about that. I, I did want to mention one thing about transit. Transit, um, our, you know, the, the two design topics that we focus at transit stations specifically, we're really looking at the actual station layout. Um, and one thing that is is, is really important when it comes to, to transit stations is a lot of times that they don't, the, the transit agency doesn't own the nearby street. Um, and so one recommendation is doing walking and biking assessments with the, the roadway owners, um, typically, you know, the state DOTs or the local jurisdictions, um, and doing a lot of interagency coordination, getting everyone in the room and talking about how do we make this safe for, for pedestrians and bicyclists to access the transit. Um, so we don't specifically touch on that, but we do cover a lot of the, the kind of the principles and design strategies um, that can be applied for that. Okay, thanks, I'll, Michelle. I appreciate it. Michelle, maybe I'll just add really quickly from, from FHWA's perspective, I'll say that um, in all the documents that we're putting out, we're, we're being really careful to not try to recreate the wheel, um, and so we are providing, you know, copious references to other existing resources at the appropriate time. Um, and so the goal is, is to really kind of help in that process that I described early on, which is to get people comfortable navigating between resources um, and recognizing that when we get into certain issues, um, you really need to go directly to the source. And so a lot of, you'll see all the documents that we've been putting out um, in, those, in, in those instances, we, we encourage the reader to go straight to the source and, and get the original information from sort of the authoritative documents. Great. And, and Connor, I think you may have had a follow-up on this one as well. Yeah, the, the question is the perfect example of why performance measures are important because as intersections change over time, usually a change is triggered by 
uh, excessively long delay for vehicles. So, okay, now we'll put in a left turn lane, and now the crossing for pedestrians is, is longer. And then, oh, this, this side needs a new through lane, and now speeds are faster, and bikes don't have a place to go. So when we're only measuring intersection performance using volume to capacity ratio and vehicle delay, we don't understand the impacts to other modes in, a, in as objective a way. Um, but the, the resources that FHWA is putting forward and, and you know, recent innovations, we have ways of quantifying these, these impacts. Um, and I think it's important that we consider the changes, every change in intersection for all modes, and then how do we prioritize which of those changes um, makes the most sense. Great. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's, that's, a, that's a great comment, Connor. Thank you. Um, the next question is sort of about, uh, I got a, a few questions on this topic, so I think I, I was going to try to kind of pull them together in, in a way, and, and I'm, I'm thinking more, so we, we've seen exactly, you know, what you all have laid out in these guides, the sort of the guiding principles, what, what you uh, think are the best possible ways to kind of approach these various topics. Um, but I'm thinking about if, if an agency were to sort of pick up each of these, if these, these documents and kind of start using them, what you all see as maybe the, the barriers that they would face in really taking these concepts and really uh, working them into their, their ongoing projects and processes. And so when I'm looking at, for example, the performance measures guide, um, what seems to come out in a lot of cases is, is uh, you know, there are all these measures that you can use, I think 30 total that you all uh, laid out that you can develop and track, but, but it, po it might possibly be that the data availability uh, that an agency has access to might might serve as maybe a barrier to which which ones they can and can't end up using. Do you all do you all see that as maybe a, one of the bigger barriers that agencies would have to grapple with, Connor and Carl specifically? That definitely came up over and over again through our research process, and uh, frankly, a lot of agencies are still wanting to just know how many people are walking and biking on their system. And so, um, what we're talking about are things things you can do beyond just counting, beyond just demand-based analysis, um, with data that are generally readily available. If you, if you flip through the guide, that red box with the data needs and sources are things you, like the U.S. Census data um, and GIS information that most agencies, at least most medium to large size agencies, usually have these days. Uh, so I think you know, the answer is, of course, yes, data is a major limitation, but um, I don't think we need to box ourselves into just those types of measures that require numbers of people walking and biking. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot broader thinking that can be done. No. Oh, Carl, you want to add to that? No, you no, know, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great summary. And I mean, of course, you know, we, you can also use this, especially the way that the guide is laid out, looking at community goals to sort of map out, uh, you know, future data collection goals and processes and partner agencies to who may already be collecting similar data and stuff that, that can be used for, for these types of analyses. So um, yeah, it's certainly certainly uh, certainly important, but but like Connor said, don't don't allow that to be a barrier. Well and that, and that was what I was thinking of uh, when I when I asked the question sort of um, you know an agency might look at a guide about performance measures and think, oh we barely have our crash data in, in shape. Like we're not going to be able to measure anything else. But I think if you you look at the the various data elements that or data sources, you might find quickly that there are, there are plenty of them that are just out there ready for you to use. It's just a matter of whether you can identify them and track them. So I think that um, hopefully that wouldn't be a barrier to an agency kind of picking this up and running and running with it. Um, and it, but then on the flip side, uh, Michelle, when I look at the the achieving multimodal networks guide, um, it, it almost seems like it addresses a, a different barrier or a different issue, and that might be um, sort of an, an agency's culture of how they typically go about their design practices, what uh, agencies are using in terms of, um, you know, if they're, if they're really sticking to the green book, for example, and not necessarily looking at other guides. And do you see sort of agency culture and kind of shifting that as a big part of whether an agency can kind of move toward uh, flexibility in their designs? Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, that's one of the key things is that when we were developing this guide was we kind of took the, the 12 design topics um, that are in the flexibility part and, and try to, deal, to dig down to like what is the barrier and how can that be addressed. So as I mentioned at the beginning, these are standalone four-page documents. So if you're having trouble trying to do a road diet, for example, you know, you can pull these four pages out and bring them to your meeting. Um, they say FHWA on them. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's 
giving practitioners those tools so that they feel comfortable going into these meetings and bringing these topics up and trying to break down those barriers. Um, and I don't know if Dan, you wanted to add anything. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, I'd agree with what you said. I think it's it's a conversation that needs to happen at, at the local level and the MPO level and the state DOT level. Um, you know, from FHWA's perspective, we've been very supportive of design flexibility. Um, you know, AASHTO has, um, has indicated some support through their um, various committees that, that that this is the direction that that they're moving as well. Um, I think, you know, on the design flexibility side, I think that um, from FHWA's perspective, it's it's very important that people participate in the formal experimentation process. Um, you know, Michelle mentioned um, engineering judgment and documentation of decisions, and those are things that are um, very important as part of the process. And another one is. Um, participating in the formal experimentation process, specifically um, the FHWA's MUTCD experimentation process. Um, and the, the goal of that and, and the reason you participate in that is so that we can learn lessons from that experimentation and so that we can apply things more broadly if, if the data and the research warrant it. And so one thing I want to encourage people to do is to participate in that process um, and not be too intimidated by it because we have folks um, at FHWA that are standing by to, to work with you and figure out kind of a really constrained um, process for, for experimenting um, in a way that still gets us data back at the national level that, that we can use to make decisions that, that we need to, to make. So I think, you know, a lot of the challenges on design flexibility um, I know that data availability is, is a challenge, and that's, that's a very real challenge. Um, I would say that, you know, with emerging technology, I think that the data um, situation five to ten years from now is likely going to be very different than it is right now, um, just because of innovation, technology innovation. And so I would encourage folks at agencies to be thinking forward um, you know, assuming that, that more and better data um, are going to be available most likely. Um, in the meantime, FHWA is doing a lot on the data side. Um, for example, updating the TMAS system so that it can receive, so it has the functional ability to receive pedestrian and bicycle volume data at the national level. Um, that's something that you'll be hearing from us soon. And it's a, you know, a role that we have to play in the process, which is, um, at the national level, try to set up the structure and the framework for the data, which then gets collected and utilized and, and used to inform planning decisions more at the local and MPO and state level. So, um, you know, that's on the, the volume side, but then also we recognize on the infrastructure side, I'd encourage you to look at the Bike Network Mapping Idea Book, um, and specifically, you know, we made a special effort to actually show the map legend from a whole bunch of different maps in that one resource. And the goal of that is to sort of stimulate that conversation about what infrastructure data looks like, how it's organized, what you track, what you don't track, how much detail you go into. Um, it's all, that's all kind of part of what the conversation that needs to happen in the transportation planning process. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. I think um, that it does seem that the, the challenges are out there, but it, but it seems like you've outlined good ways uh, in these guides to kind of overcome them. So uh, that's really promising. Uh, there, there have been a few questions about um, examples of, of agencies that are doing these things or who, who's actually you know, using these performance metrics or who's actually um, kind of using got good examples of design flexibility. Um, and so I'd ask, I guess, uh, Connor and Carl and, and Michelle, um, if you have recommendations for where people can go uh, to find more information, I mean, I, I, I guess I want to note that in each of the guides, uh, you make references to a lot of specific examples of projects. And I know Carl, Connor and Carl, for example, you, to develop your guidance, you, do, you interviewed and worked with a lot of different agencies at all different levels. So um, is that a good recommendation then, is for folks to kind of refer to these guides and, and find those agencies that might be doing the best job and, and kind of follow their lead? I'll say that was, um, uh, I'll give credit to Dan Goodman uh, at the outset of, that, of the research effort. He um, 
wisely points us to the value of, um, of peer examples. And so we made a strong effort to include at least one, and in, in almost all cases, more than one direct example of agencies that are tracking the, the measure for each of the um, performance measures listed. And um, I think that's a great place to start. That list, of course, is static and it won't reflect things that are happening since then. Um, but FHWA it has various initiatives where they're trying to connect peer agencies with one another to help help them understand um, who's doing what and, and how. And I don't know, Dan Goodman, if you want to say anything more about some of those efforts at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we have a lot um, sort of on the capacity building side. I'd encourage you to look at FHWA's capacity building um, website and resources. Um, but as you said, we, you know, all the documents we're putting out, specifically the two that we focused on in this webinar, there's a lot of case studies in in both of those documents. And as as Connor mentioned, the real the purpose of that is to show that it's that it's doable, it's manageable that people are doing it, and, and sometimes that's the role that we can play at the national level is to point people to those other other agencies that are doing something similar and encourage you to reach out to them. Um, I'd also encourage you to reach out to the state DOT pedestrian and bicycle coordinators. In your state, you have a pedestrian and bicycle coordinator um, who's a really good, a good resource for what's happening in the state. Um, FHWA has a division office in every single state also. Um, and we have an identified pedestrian and bicycle point of contact in that division office. Um, and that group is also a really good resource. Um, if you're looking for examples of things happening in a state, um, I'd encourage you to reach out to them as well. Though their contact information is available on our pedestrian and bicycle program page on our website. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan, and, and thanks to everybody. We are uh, right at the end of our, our time, unfortunately. So um, I would encourage you, if you have additional questions that we weren't able to answer, uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, we, we always are interested in following up with you and connecting you with more um, information if, if we didn't get to, get to your topic of interest. So uh, with that being said, though, I, I did want to make sure we left some time, uh, Dan, for you to cover um, another uh, resource you all are working on and expect to come out. Uh, pretty soon. So do you want to talk about this uh, small and uh, small town and rural multimodal networks guide? Yeah, yeah, I know we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to encourage people to give, give you a heads up um, that we'll be, FHWA will be publishing uh, pretty soon a small town and rural multimodal networks resource. Um, the goal is really to, to show what pedestrian and bicycle networks look like in rural and small town areas um, and to make sure that we send the message that um, people in rural and small town areas um, also have a need to walk and bike, but the physical infrastructure um, will look a little bit different than it does in an urban area um, because of geographic constraints and physical constraints. Um, but, but that providing for multimodal connectivity is just as important in rural areas. And so our document is really going to, along the same lines of our previous documents, it's really going to show the art of the possible. It's going to talk a lot about case studies. Um, and it's going to really um, dive into the details on, on what your planning and design options are um, to improve pedestrian and bicycle connectivity in rural areas. It, it's going to encourage innovation, provide a lot of different examples, and, and really you know, try to bridge that gap between existing resources and, and rural practice. Um, and we, we hope to publish that um, next month or, or January, possibly. Um, so, so keep your eye out for that. Great. Thanks very much, Dan. We'll be on the, on the lookout for that. Uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, that you are going to be receiving an email uh, later today uh, that will contain a link to our webinar archive page. And if you want to visit it right away, you can go to pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. That is where we've archived the presentation materials. Uh, it is where we'll post the uh, video recording when it's available. The email you receive will also have link, uh, instructions for downloading your certificate of attendance. Uh, as a reminder, please do distribute that to the others who are attending with you so that they can also uh, provide uh, or get a certificate for their attendance as well. Um, I want to, uh, one final reminder, I'll let you know that a very brief survey is going to appear once the webinar is ended. We would really appreciate your feedback uh, and, and uh, information about what you'd like to see us cover in future sessions. Uh, so please take some time to fill that out. Uh, and then I just want to say thanks again to uh, Dan Goodman, uh, Michelle Danilla, Connor Similar, Carl Thunstrom, uh, all for delivering 
today's presentations. Uh, and a special thanks to all of you uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so hope to see you on the next webinar and uh, have a great day. Thank you.